So if somebody's coming in considering to be an officer right now, what advice or what things would you tell them? Man, um, I'd say buckle up. I think um, I underestimated what would be asked of me. And, and I, I visualized it a lot before I joined. Um, and, and I thought deeply about what service in the, the Army would be like. It met a lot of my expectations. It was far more high paced, far more time consuming, far more difficult yeah. than I could have imagined. Right. Welcome to the Leading with Vulnerability podcast. I'm your host, Yuma Barnett, and today I have Justin Lane, or as he's more formally known in his work environment, Captain Lane. But I've known Justin dating back to when I was a 375 operations sergeant major. He came in a three shop, his second trip back to 3rd Ranger Battalion, and we rode away together in the in the three shop, how people do. And, and, and Justin went on, became a company commander at 3rd Ranger Battalion, and is now up at regimental staff rowing again in the, in the three shop, um, oh, yeah. you know, loving his life. And I say that with a little bit of sarcasm, but um, he's a great ranger, a great family man. I'm glad he took a moment to come on here and uh, share some of his story. And we're going to talk a little bit of the path of kind of the Army officer, why he chose that and kind of what the Army officer career path looks like, the future looks like as the, as the Army is going through change. But I'll hand it over to Justin, let him introduce himself, and we'll get on with the conversation. Sure. So, um, uh, Justin Lane, I, uh, I've been serving for about 10 years now. Uh, I'm married to Brittany, been married to her for nine years. We have two children, uh, a two-year-old and, uh, and a five-year-old. I uh, came into the Army right out of, uh, out of college. I did the ROTC program at George Mason University and uh, went straight into the infantry, kind of hit the usual, you know, um, eye bullock and ranger school went out and when it was a platoon leader went to, went overseas a little bit came back and then and then competed for service in the regiment and was fortunate enough to to be selected and uh and assigned there and I'm, I'm super grateful that you're having me on today Yuma. i've been you know watching from afar this show and and um you know guys like dan damshin and and dan Ferreter and uh, and can american and i don't know that i'm in that cohort or uh, or of that caliber of a man but uh you know i'm honored to be here and i really do appreciate you having me on yeah i'm, I'm happy to have you here that i absolutely think you're in that caliber we're all the we're all the same, same, same blood when it goes back to the regiment. So thanks for coming on. Uh, tell me a little bit about just your, your growing up, your, your childhood, uh, kind of what led you all the way into, uh, into college. Sure. So, um, I, uh, I was born in Texas. Family has a, a long history there in, uh, in the Texas Hill country, west of Austin, uh, a couple of hours and uh, family, you know, has a, has a ranch out there and, and just a, a long, long history in the state of Texas. Um, was born there and, uh, you know, lived with my mom and dad until, um, you know, well, until I, I entered service later on. But um, when we were young, uh, my brother was born when I was six or eight years old and, and kind of a traditional upbringing, you know, Southern Baptist, shooting yeah. guns, hunting deer, um, and, and sort of that, that experience you would expect of that part of the country. Um, experienced some, you know, some hardship, frankly, early in life. Uh, the family did anyway. And, and I watched you know, my, my family display a lot of resilience and overcome, you know, some, um, some challenges early on when my, uh, when my little brother was two years old, I was eight or so years old. He, um, he suffered a, a grandma seizure, uh, that lasted, you know, about an hour, hour and a half, and just an extremely long, you know, medical catastrophe, frankly, that, um, he wasn't supposed to live through and it, it incapacitated him severely. He was in the hospital, uh, for, for months and in treatment for years, um, you know, went from a happy, healthy toddler going to bed one night to all of a sudden having to relearn how to walk and, and how to, you know, how to, how to breathe and how to eat and was in a coma for a while. Um, so pretty severe. Um, and, uh, you know, as a, as a kid, it was difficult for me to kind of watch and appreciate that impact it was having on him and on my family, um, required a lot from, from my parents, as you might imagine. And, um, and, you know, fortunately he was able to overcome a lot of that. He's doing great today. But, but it definitely played a, a significant role early in my life. Um, and, uh, and, you know, later on, my, um, my, my mom and dad ended up getting separated. We ended up actually moving my mom, my brother, and I up to the northern Virginia, Washington, D.C. area, which kind of affected my going to the George Mason University ROTC yeah. program later on. Um, but, but during that time, you know, watching my single mom take care of my special needs brother, um, just to display a ton of resilience, had a, had a profound impact you know, on me early in life, just, um, you know, witnessing someone, you know, yeah. leading with vulnerability yeah, as it were, <laughs> but, uh, but she, she's always kind of set the example for me in that regard and, and just making the best of bad situations, 
um, and kind of fighting through with a lot of resilience to, to get the best outcomes possible. Yeah, and a, a question that comes to mind right off the bat. So coming into the Army and, and then the Ranger Regiment and all the selections and everything you have to go through. Mm -hmm. So seeing your brother who goes through something like that, and you were there through, you know, from eight until you left. Were there moments when you're in your army phases and stuff and you look back and you said, this is nothing compared to what my brother went through, suck it up and get through this type thing? Oh, yeah. I I, um, I was extremely close to him. I mean, I still am. Um, and growing up, especially with, um, you know, my mom, she was working to provide for us, you right. know, after, after my parents, you know, separated. And she uh, so she had to invest a ton at work to take care of us and then a ton, you know, emotionally. And you know, as a mother to, to take care of us at home. But, you know, when she was working a lot, I was taking care of my brother a whole lot, um, you know, helping, you know, get dinner ready and just, you know, take care of him so she could provide for us financially and, and come home and, you know, to a house that hopefully I didn't let burn down and, and a, a young special needs kid that hopefully is, uh, you know, well groomed and in right. good order when she gets there. Um, but yeah, it, one 100 percent, I, I reflect on those periods of time in my life what my brother experienced, what my mom experienced, frankly, what my dad experienced during those times as well. Um, and, you know, I think after you, you, you get through some tough times and we've all experienced them. I don't think what I've gone through is, is anything compared to what my mom's gone through and, or what my brother's gone through or, or what, uh, you know, anyone else has gone through in their life. But once you experience some of that hardship and have to overcome it, it, it certainly gives you kind of a, a, a stress inoculation yeah. as it were. Yeah. Um, give you a chance to kind of fight through it. I, I agree. So, you know, my parents divorced when I was five and I saw this, my, you know, we moved around a lot. My mom was working, you know, and trying to get me to school and go to work and pay the bills. And I, I often reflected back on that time when I was in service and I thought things were getting hard. And I remembered like my mom in particular, like what she went through and what she yeah. did to make sure that I didn't, it didn't bother. I mean, it didn't phase my life, you know, uh, it, it puts a lot of perspective in the things and those things that you go through when you're younger, even though they, you know, it sounds cliche, that resiliency and kids, you know, kids can do put up with anything. Oh, yeah. I think it really helps build you into this soft community because there's a lot of us that went through the divorce or had some sort of traumatic event when we were younger that are really successful in, in the soft community ac across all, you know, tiers and sure. platforms. So it's interesting when you sit down and talk about stuff like that, because that's not something you talk about when you're having a, a company commander meeting no. and stuff, but, <laughs> you know, but uh, we probably should a little bit more. So people will realize that we are more coherent or, you know, cohesive than, the, than they understand. So that, I mean, that brings it perfectly into the, the leading question that starts all this. If, uh, what, what would your definition of vulnerability be? I think, um, I think it means to have, an open mind and an open heart um, and be willing to, you know, receive feedback and criticism and be eager and empathetic to hear other stories yeah. and, uh, and to use those things that you've struggled with throughout your life or, or your own weaknesses as opportunities to, to help others, you yeah. know, grow. Yeah. And I think you hit on something very key there that is, it's key, but it's also difficult, or I found it difficult, is receiving that criticism, right? Sure. The, especially the A-type personality, senior NCO, when, you, when you're receiving criticism or told that you didn't do something right. It's, yeah. It is hard. It's humbling. It's hard, you know, and, uh, and, but once you get better at that and realize that it's not for malice, it's to make you better. It makes you better. And I love hearing everybody's definitions of vulnerability and, and what it is. Cause I don't think it has one. It, it means something to everybody, you know, it means something a little bit different to everybody. So, um, so you joined the army as an, as an officer, um, you came in, you went to ROTC, um, what, what's that path kind of look like uh, for somebody out there that's thinking about yeah. you know, that transition and, and going into the military or ROTC? Yeah, so it was a um, huge decision for anybody, obviously. It, I, I wouldn't go so far as to say it was, you know, predetermined, but but there was certainly a, a set of events in my life that drove me that route. Um, you know, growing up in the way that I did, you know, exposed to the outdoors and to firearms and to hunting and to that sort of stuff very early in my life, I think... Um, that coupled with a, a traditional sort of Southern upbringing. And, um, you know, it, it just kind of paved the way for what was probably inevitably a career in the military or service in some capacity. Um, I ended up going to a, a military boarding school, um, voluntarily, actually, something I wanted to do when I was in high school. Um, and, you know, I, I got kind of a foundation of, of patriotism and service and leadership from that institution. It's called Fort Union Military Academy. It's in a little town in central Virginia. And um, it was really at that that 
school where I decided I wanted to serve. And in my junior, senior year of high school, I knew I wanted to serve. Um, you know, the, the GWAT was in full, uh, full swing. I graduated in 2007. I was watching the surge on the news. And my first inclination was like enlist and get overseas as fast as possible. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, talked to the, the recruiters and, and had ASVABs lined up and was looking at MEP states and trying to figure out when I'd be able to ship out. Um, you know, but I was fortunate because I went to that institution and, you know, they'd instilled academic discipline in me to have been pretty successful um, academically and otherwise in high school. And so I had all these opportunities in the way of potential higher education. And, and naturally, my, my family was eager to see me oh, right. yeah. go do those things. Um, and they had they had committed, you know, considerable about, amount of um you know, financial support for me right. to even go to this boarding school. So if, if I had the opportunity to go to college for free, courtesy of an ROTC scholarship, that was something that they were eager for me to pursue. And, and frankly, something that I was, I was eager to pursue, pursue as well. Um, so I kind of made the decision junior, senior year of high school that that's what I wanted to do. I applied uh, for those ROTC scholarships and for, you know, acceptance into various academic institutions. Um, I got the scholarship offer and the, you know, application acceptance at George Mason University um, in Fairfax, Virginia, and, and kind of made the call there um, to attend that school. Usual four-year program, as you just, uh, as you'd imagine, I, I decided to make it five, took a victory lot based off of um, some lapses in discipline there early in the, <laughs> the first couple years. Um, but uh, but it was it's a great program. Um, ROTC is, I'm sure it's changed, but but kind of my experience was, you know, you end up taking two or three kind of, you know, single um, classes a week. It might be like a PT session. It might be, uh, you know, sit down in a classroom and get a couple hours of information, usually from a senior NCO as a, as a freshman. Um, and it's like your entry level military stuff, you know, you know, ranks, how to read, read a, a compass, how the army's organized, just big picture kind of stuff. Um, gets a little bit more advanced as you, you progress through the institution. Um, they break that up with some summer training. So, um, you might have the opportunity to go to airborne school. And that's actually, you know, when I, when I attended airborne school. So as you went as to airborne school or still a cadet? I did, school, I did. Yeah. Which, um, that was my first like real exposure to the active duty army. Right. And, I, and I went there as a, a cadet with a little dot on my chest, <laughs> you know, and you can imagine how, uh, was it a little bit of a shock to you? It was a shock. I was all in though. Right. I mean, I, I think we all are at that stage yeah. in our career. You know, it was just, I was, uh, extremely motivated and I had the, the high end tight to boot and I was just excited to be there. And, right. and I just was everything, uh everything army, uh, in all the most cliche ways right. you can imagine. Um, but I enjoyed it. Um, knocked out airborne school. I think the next summer I went to what's called the, the leadership development and assessment course, LDAC. They may have renamed it at this point, but Probably, yeah. it's, uh, you know, it's 30 days in the field, um, you know, PT tests, land nav patrols, leadership evaluations, that sort of thing. Is that the one that's up in uh, Fort Lewis? So that was up in Fort Lewis. They were doing it every summer up in Fort Lewis. I think since then they've moved it, Cadet Command's moved it to oh, Fort okay. Knox. Okay. Um, the POI, so far as I know, is pretty similar with with minor changes, but the, the end result is the same. They're, they're doing leadership evaluations. And, and the kind of the way it it worked was um, even though I had that ROTC scholarship, doesn't mean that you're necessarily going to be an active duty officer. Um, they usually take, you know, a chunk of the class, usually about 50% ends up on active duty. The other 50% ends up in the guard wow. and in the reserve. And even those who do go active duty doesn't mean you get the branch, you right. know, that you, that you want. Um, so at that point I decided I, I wanted to serve in the infantry. I didn't necessarily know all that that would entail. Um, but, uh, but I was hard committed to it. Infantry is pretty competitive, um, believe it or not for the officer corps. So, you have to you have to do reasonably well academically. You have to do great in all the PT and leadership stuff. Um, they kind of take those two evaluations, cram them together, you know, stack you against all your peers, and and then they just go down the list. And yeah. and if you're fortunate enough to to be ranked high enough to get the slot, um, then that's what you're assigned. However, um, I mentioned that I had some lapses in discipline academically yeah. early in college, so that put me in a position where I was not competitive for infantry, and I had oh, right. to. I had to do um, what's called an additional duty service obligation. Basically, I promised the Army an additional three years of active service in exchange for them letting me uh, be an infantryman. But yeah, and, um, it's, a, it's a great path. It's a great way for people to go get their education, get so you don't come out of there in, in debt, um, and you come out of there with a job on the back end. One thing I want to highlight, and I'd like your perspective on a little bit, the infantry kind of gets a bad rap sometimes when you're thinking the industry side they do because mm. we you know we we call ourselves grunts and you know we have all these kind of terms that make us seem like we're not as intelligent as we might be but in truth the smartest officers i've ever seen and the smartest ncos i've ever been around way smarter than me we're all infantry guys um why why is that why are the, why are you guys drawn to the infantry 
Um, I don't think I'm a, a particularly intelligent officer, but I do appreciate the insinuation. Um, it's, uh, it's hard. Yeah. I mean, it's the reason that you have high performers in hard jobs is because it takes hard, high performers to accomplish hard tasks. And, uh, and the infantry is hard. Right. It is extremely hard. It's, it becomes more so along the route. So, I mean, it's hard when you start. It's even harder at ranger school. It's even harder once you're finally in charge. It becomes even more harder if you decide to compete for selection to a special operations organization. And it just keeps getting harder. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and frankly, the people who thrive in that environment, they have to be good. Right. They, they just have to be or, or have some, um, you know, some sort of uh, affinity for, for enduring it and, and performing well in it. Um, and, and the same thing, when, when I look to the, the officers who, you know, I admire the most and um, who impress me the most professionally and as just as men, um, they are usually infantrymen. And yeah. I'm exposed to a lot of infantrymen, yeah. but, uh, but nonetheless, I mean, there's, there's certainly a, a positive correlation there. And I, I'm not, nothing disparaging against the other branches or stuff, but uh, the, the infantry has the bulk of the, of the people, you know, a large amount of the personnel. And I've just always noticed the infantry is a place where the, the term, the cream rises to the top is, yeah. is probably the most adequate way to describe the infantry to me, because uh, you, you have to be able to make decisions in a snap. And those decisions might cost the lives of, yeah. at some levels, thousands of people. And at our levels, hundreds of people. And it just takes a special person to be able to, to make those decisions and, and make it timely and accurate. It's 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 a really interesting place the infantry is that I don't think gets a lot of the credit that it that it deserves. Um, so as it, through the army, you've been in how how long now? Just shy of ten years. So you're going. The army's going through change now. We mm -hmm. ki we came out of Afghanistan. Um, we're gonna leave the what's going on in Europe. We're not even gonna discuss that because that's a whole nother <laughs> a whole nother bag of, of of stuff there to unpack. But going through change is, is difficult. Um, I, you joined when the war was going on, and the and the and you wanted to you joined to go do that to go mm -hmm. serve your country in, in combat, and. Right now, as it stands, that's harder to do for somebody coming in off of the street. You're, there's not that guarantee that you're going to go lead men in, in combat. But I still think the Army's a great place to come. I know I've talked to some um, people who wanted to come in on the enlisted side and had a lot of questions about what do you do now that you <laughs> yeah. don't have the war all the time, you're not deployed all the time. What does it kind of look like from, from the officer's perspective? Sure. So no doubt period of change. Um as you alluded to, I joined to, to go overseas. I, I, you know, I wanted to go to Iraq and Afghanistan and all these places, and I was lucky to have some of those experiences. And I think on the enlisted side and on the officer side, everyone is kind of wondering what's next. Yeah. Um, I have no anxiety, no fear, and no concern for the Army. Um, it is filled with phenomenal people. It is a resilient organization. It adapts rapidly to change. Sometimes you'll, you know, you'll start complaining about change and, and then one day you'll, you'll realize that, um, we've already adapted to it. Like right. there's, you re, there, you reflect just, you know, 30 days, 45 days, 60 days prior and you're like, weren't we all griping about this? Uh, and then all of a sudden the problem solved. Uh, so I foresee that happening now. Um, it's a, it's a leadership challenge from, you know, the officer perspective. Yeah. We have a responsibility to, to keep our organizations focused on the mission. And right now the mission is to be ready for the next mission. Right. Um, and, and that job is no less important than the one we were doing when we were going overseas all the time. Right. Um, and sort of when I, when I left Charlie company last year, kind of what I, what I told the guys kind of like in my, in my, uh, you know, little huddle before we took off is, is the next fight's coming. Um, you know, we don't get to pick when necessarily, um, or how, or, or, or what it'll be like or feel like, but, but what is certain for the Ranger regiment is that when it comes, you're going to be the first people in the Department of Defense asked to go solve that problem yeah. on behalf of the nation. And just because you don't see the next deployment on the calendar doesn't mean it's not on the calendar. Right. It's there. You right. just don't know the date yet. Right. Yeah. It's the, when, I'm, when I'm talking to people who are either still in or thinking about coming in, I, when they're asking about, I want to go to, you know, it's a weird thing, but people want to go to combat and, and try themselves and, and see how they lead. I just say, it's kind of like the weather in Georgia. You just got to wait. You just got to wait a minute. Oh, yeah. If you look at history at all, you know, once every five to 10 years, something happens sure. that involves the 75th sure. Range Regiment or, or 82nd or any of the other, um, any of the other, you know, military forces. So just, 
be patient. And I think also the change is a, is a natural filter because sometimes you don't need the same leadership that you have in a wartime environment. We've all heard there's the guy that's in the company that's, you know, he's terrible in garrison break and, you know, break the case in time of war. He's great on the objective. He's great overseas, but he's not necessarily a garrison leader, somebody that preps people mm-hmm. for the for the unknown fight. And I, I've i seen it. I think it's just kind of a natural filter. That cream will rise to the top. The, the, the next generation will prepare the next group of people for the fight. And everything, like you said, it's going to be okay. We're, we're going to be fine. It, it, the right leaders will, will find their way to where they need to be. I think they that's something that we've always done well in the Army, in, sure. in, the, in the U.S. military area as a whole. So Absolutely. Um, I'd, I'd say the... Um, Uncertainty requires even higher levels of leadership, frankly. Right. It's a different style of leadership than leading an assault. Yeah. Um, but there's no doubt that when the mission is unknown and your job is to keep people um, disciplined, motivated, and, yeah. and, and you know moving towards that next challenge, which is still unknown, I mean, that's hard to do. Right. Um, so if people are considering you know, joining to serve, like, we need you now. Right, exactly. <laughs> we, we need those phenomenal, uh, those phenomenal people as part of the organization now right. to, to go do the job. Yeah, and just because it's not as sexy right now, right? What I always told new rangers when they came in to my company or platoon is it's it's not about the the nods you know the nice nods and the fancy weapons and the yeah. fancy body armor it's about doing uncommon tasks you know very well or I mean, doing the common tasks you know uncommonly well and uh it'll it will be fine like you said and, and it, it's on the horizon so if somebody's coming in considering to be an officer right now what advice or what thing would, would you tell them man um i'd say buckle up I think um, I underestimated what would be asked of me. And, and I, I visualized it a lot before I joined. Um, and, and I thought deeply about what service in the, the Army would be like. It met a lot of my expectations. It was far more high-paced, far more time-consuming, far more difficult yeah. than I could have imagined. Right. And, uh, and so I'd encourage those you know, that are on the cusp of making that decision or, or joining the organization or, you know, those young officers that are about to go lead formations for the first time um, to buckle up and uh, kind of steal yourself before you experience, you know, these things. And, and there's a way to do it easily. There's a way to be comfortable. Right. Um, it's not the right way. Right. And so if you want to do the job right, it, it's going to take a lot of you is the bottom line. Yeah. Um, so kind of be the first one. The second would be, um, be and it's, it's the classic advice, but it's just enter your job with humility and an extraordinarily humble and empathetic. Um, and those three traits coupled with high degrees of intelligence and competence yeah. will yield a good result. So be eager to learn from people who you trust to teach you. Um, you know, we often look to our, our senior and CEO counterparts um, as the, the teachers of our young officers and, and 99% of the time that's the right answer. Um, so seek out those, those people for guidance. And, and to this point in my career, I still and always will lean on the NCOs that I'm partnered with to, to make me a better man and a better officer. Um, and, uh, and so that's a huge part of it. So it'd be buckle up, yeah. um, get ready to work and work hard. That's, you owe it to your people to do that yeah. um, and do it with a, a, a heart that is open for feedback and full of humility. Yeah. A couple of things you said there I think is, is interesting. It, it is hard. It is difficult. No matter how much training you go through or somebody like me who spent you know almost 20 years in the regiment, every time I found myself in a new leadership position, I was kind of like, Wow, this is yeah. What am I doing here? Yeah, right? it's it's you gotta. It is it is it's a humbling. It's a hum, the army and it's a humbling experience to know that you're responsible for people's sure. lives, you know, and not just a bottom line of numbers. And the second point is uh, vulnerability, empathy, and uh, humility. Just because you have those three traits and exhibit them doesn't mean you're not a tough leader or t- hard on or expect to standards and no doubt. and everything. It's it's just that you're a more well-rounded leader, and I think a lot of people get confused if you you're soft or you're you're weak or you're you, you're not able to lead if you have those traits. What what are your thoughts on that? Um, I, I mean, I, I, it's obviously untrue yeah. that people with a, a a big open heart who love their soldiers can't be effective and hard leaders. Um, you know, some of the people who have led me best uh, have been extraordinarily humble and empathetic. Um, and, and fun to hang out with and joke around with, yeah. but then fierce in the face of the enemy um, and, uh, and hard men. Um, you know, I, I think of, uh, you know, Will Freakley and Joe Lockknit and, and some of these guys who are, they can, they can just be your best buddy, um, but then are, uh, are known quantities on the battlefield that are, are not to be reckoned with. Right. Um, so I think it, 
it's also, you owe it to your people to care about them and to lead them with an open heart and humility. And they will admire you more when you demonstrate the capacity to do that and then flip the switch and, uh, and lead aggressively um, and decisively uh, in combat and in training. Yeah, I think sometimes it's overlooked or some people don't realize that being a leader in the military and a coach are very similar things, right? Uh, in the March Madness time, I'm watching my team Duke yesterday and Coach K, good thing he's not mic'd up because you can read his <laughs> lips when he's giving his team the business on yeah. the sideline when they're not hustling and they're not paying attention or not doing what was asked. But in a post-game interview, you can see how much that man loves those kids on his team. Sure. Um, but he expects a lot of them. And uh, the two go hand in hand. And it's the same as in sports as it is in, in, the, in military, military leadership. Um, so all your time in the 75th, um, it's a special organization. Sure. I, I love that organization. It's, uh, it's, just, it's just different, right? We're the only soft entity that has privates, right? The lower enlisted <laughs> class, yeah. which is our greatest strength and our greatest weakness at times. Um, and I think more on the, on the strength. But through your time, you platoon leader time in the 75th, company commander time, you spent time on staff variously. Um, what has that place meant to you as you're about to exit? Oh, man. Um, I mean, it's huge. It's uh, I I was in Afghanistan in 2014 as a conventional army platoon leader, um, and I was running QRF for this you know special operational organization. And uh, you know they go out on target and come back. We get a quick debrief, and then we go back to the hooch. And then a couple of days later, they ask for us to come support again, and we go sit by the trucks and kit and monitor on the radio, and then they come back and get a debrief, and then we go back to the hooch. Um, and I learned, you know, after pulling QRF for them several times that that was a, it was a strike force from, uh, from the range regiment and, uh, interacted with their leadership and watching them go do the job in this, um, you know, the way they carried themselves, their professionalism, uh, that they carried themselves with the fact that they used their own time to rehearse with my guys and to train them. Um, I just saw a degree of doing it right that I hadn't witnessed in the service before. And, and I decided immediately while I was forward there that I was going to go to RASP when I got home. Or compete to go to RASP. Uh, so as soon as I did, I you know came home, dropped a packet, um, went to selection, worked out, and uh, and then we were off to the races. The organization has had you know the most profound impact on me professionally as it, anything that you could possibly imagine. It it is uh, it's been a huge huge part of my world, part of my family's world. It has been you know the end goal for my service in the army. From the moment I worked with that strike force, you know, in Afghanistan was to serve in the 75th Ranger Regiment. Um, and I did, you know, and then, uh, and then I, I went back to the big army to command a company and then I competed to come back to the 75th Ranger Regiment and it worked out. And so for, for as long as I can remember knowing about the Ranger Regiment, my goal has, to been, to, has been to be in it and to be close to Rangers um, and to be able to serve alongside them. So I, I can't understate, you know, how, um, you know, how formative it has been serving as a Ranger. Yeah, it's, it's, it's hard to explain for people who've never been been in it. It's a great or the army in general is a great place to be. It's just it's it's a little bit more refined. That you we have to go through a selection process. You find more people that are like you. You're challenged every day to be your best, uh, be your best self because everybody around you is just, in my opinion, better than I was ever. And I just wanted to be as good as them. It's it's great, and I, I know it's gonna you're gonna and it, well, you said that it's part of your family's oh, yeah. life too. It's it, it's ingrained throughout your whole DNA. I was watching my, the other day, all my kids were going to school. Every one of them had a Rangers t-shirt on, <laughs> right? Just happened to dance that came That's out awesome. of there. So it's, it's just something that just becomes part of, part of who you are. And, uh, the organization will surely yep. miss you. And we'll talk a little bit about what you're, what you're doing as you go out. So at change, just as a leader, how do you manage change, whether it's changing from garrison environment to deploy and what's what's your take on just managing change because we're in the army as an officer you're in change every two years oh, yeah. at a minimum right you're changing either jobs duty locations uh, um, you're going to Oconus back to the states uh, your family's got to go through change how do you approach change just as a leader sure um so i think the leader's number one responsibility during change is uh, is to do it with a happy heart and an optimistic outlook um you know, you set the tone for the entire organization with the way that you carry yourself, yourself the way that you communicate. Um, so it's kind of a, a leader's responsibility. The second, you know, second to just being positive and optimistic in your outlook is uh, is setting the vision for that change. So I think um, not only setting the tone for the manner in which that change will occur, but but showing the organization uh, what it will look like 
once that change is over. Um, it's the leader's job to, to paint that picture uh, and then drive the organization towards it. Um, and the way that you accomplish both of those things, both doing it with a happy heart and, uh, and with vision, is, is to create a culture in the organization that is extremely resilient and, and adaptable uh, and able to execute. Because um, regardless of if it's going, you know, if it's deploying overseas or if it's coming home from overseas or if it's going to a training event or if it's a transition from GWAT to, you know, whatever's next, right. um, all of these changes require those kind of three ingredients in my mind. Yeah. And, and they, they transcend the, they'll go they're straight to your family too, because the families and you're changing from one base to another, your yeah. kids are changing schools. It's base, basic stuff, really of communication, setting a vision. Uh, so everybody's working towards a, you know, a defined goal or understands what the goal is. It's, but it's something that if you're not deliberate about change, it can really throw a wrench in your, in, 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 in everything that you're doing. So, um, so all that time as an officer, I think being an armory officer, I see it, it can be a real thief of somebody's time, right? Yeah. Um, it's some of it's intentional. Some of it you guys bring on yourselves, you know, with the, the competitive nature that you have, uh, you know, when I'm the first sergeant and I'm like, why is this guy staying until nine <laughs> o'clock tonight working on these, yep. on these products that are going to be looked at for two seconds. But, um, in that you have to try to achieve a balance with your family. So, and I don't think balance is something you achieve. It's something you are always striving to achieve, yeah. but uh, how do you try to do it as a husband and father? Oh, that's tough. Um, the, um, I, I wholeheartedly agree that it's something you're striving towards. It's, it's not uh, you wake up one day and it's like, I nailed it. Yeah, right. I am now balanced. Yeah. Um, frankly, I, I don't know that we'll ever achieve balance in this profession. It's not a profession for anyone, um, certainly officers uh, in our organization, uh, designed to allow you to achieve balance. Um, the, the mission in the country and the, the boys require a certain level of commitment. And oftentimes for us to achieve our mission, um, it is difficult to do it in a balanced way. What I would say is that it ebbs and flows. And while my wife and children will never get the time that I know they deserve from me, the time that they do get from me needs to be of the highest quality possible. Absolutely. So, um, you know, I've been, uh, my wife and I've been married coming up on 10 years and, uh, and I'm as committed to dating her, you know, as my girlfriend, yeah. uh, today as I, I ever have been, um, you know, my, my daughter has soccer and gymnastics and I will leave work and let my boss know, I want to go make this gymnastics. It starts at four o'clock, you know, nothing's hot. I'm going to go to my daughter's gymnastics uh, class. Or I'm going to make her soccer game. Yeah. Um, I'm going to deliberately sit down and play with my son. I'm going to go on a family vacation. So it's not fair necessarily right. that the organization, the country, the, you know, the army asks our families to, to, to give up their, um, you know, their husband for X amount of hours a week. Um, but it is still our responsibility to, to, to make the balance in quality of time, yeah. you know, not necessarily in, in actual time. Right. It, it, you said it's not about it's how you spend the time that you do have that really, really makes it matter, especially with the family and, and the little, little ones there. So all your time in uniform, what's been your most challenging day? Yeah. Or the day that, you know, sometimes you reflect on when you're alone driving home from work and you just have that moment where you remember that day. For yeah. Some reason. I, um, yeah, I, I thought about this, um, because I think like the the go to answer, I'm, I'm an extremely fair family oriented guy. The go to answer would be you know um, going overseas on on a, on a deployment, saying goodbye to the family. Um, thinking specifically to the profession, um, my unit we lost a soldier in uh, in 2018, Sergeant James Slate, uh, on October 4th. He was a, a National Guard NCO from uh, from North Carolina, um, who was an EOD tech assigned to to support our battalion. Um, and I had a platoon out in sector. Vehicle struck a IED, was disabled. The dudes rolled out the back of the truck, got to safety, um, sent the EOD detachment out to, to go help police up the, uh, the disabled vehicle and, and get the rest of the guys out of the truck because we didn't get them all out. Um, and uh, in the process of clearing that area, Sergeant Slate, unfortunately, was, uh, he activated a, pr a pressure plate and, and was killed in action shortly after. Um, so losing guys sucks, yeah. always. Um, I think, you know, what was challenging for me more so than, than the loss of life. And I can't claim to have the honor of knowing Sergeant Slape well, only in passing. Um, but, uh, as a, as a leadership challenge was 
you know, those guys came back from the mission that night. They had flushed, uh, you know, Sergeant Slape earlier and didn't know his outcome. Wow. Um, so it kind of fell to us to, to, you know, those guys just had the worst day of their life. Um, and, uh, you know, they're, they're coming back off mission and, and had to sit down and, and share that information with them and, uh, you know, help them through it and watch his, you know, friends react to the news for the first time. Um, and then to boot sort of the situation as it always does has far reaching implications. And, um, you know, there's some press, frankly, that, that came out all too soon after the event while the guys are still in the fight, um, you know, essentially, uh, calling into question some of the decisions that were made on the ground far too soon, uh, and without the requisite information to be able to comment intelligently on what happened. Um, so it was a, it was a bad day turned into a bad couple of weeks. And, um, you know, I, I really had to invest a lot in, in that platoon, especially that platoon's leadership yeah. and the, and the guys who are out there, because the reality is, uh, they did it right. They did all of it right. And they made a lot of really hard calls. And, uh, and when, when Sergeant Slave got hurt, they took care of him real good uh, and they got him out really fast. And, uh, you know, things just go sideways sometimes. Right, yeah. And, uh, and so that one, that was a tough one. Yeah, those are tough. As a leader, I would, when it's something bad happened, I find myself in moments still today going, did I make the right decision? Did I say the right thing? What yeah. could I have done better? And I think it's just it's in our nature. Sometimes we dwell on things that we can never change, hopefully, in the, hopefully because so we'll never make the same mistake or, yeah. or something again. So, yeah, and it's always tough losing somebody. And, and it's hard to pick one day that's the most challenging because saying bye to those kids is yeah. terrible. I've done it many times. And then looking looking people in the eye when they've lost somebody is, is also terrible. So it's hard to refine down to one event. But it's not all bad. You've had some great days. Yep. What's, what's a day in uniform that you remember or makes you laugh or, or that, you, that you just enjoyed? Yeah, so I think um, the uh, we talked about how important the Ranger Regiment is to me personally. Um, and it's also like a, it's like a drag race. I mean, you hit it and you hit it hard, especially as an officer. And, you know, we're on ground for two, three years, if we're lucky, just at a dead sprint the entire time. And, and sometimes you're going so fast, you, you don't stop to appreciate where you're at and who you're with and uh, what you're doing. Yeah. Um, and so there was a, uh, there was a moment on a, a training event, um, about a year ago with, uh, Brandon Hollinsworth and I in, in CK 375, it was my last training event as a company commander, um, probably my last time out with the boys, I mean, in my career, uh, just based off of, you know, being a, a senior captain about to go to, to higher levels of leadership. And, um, and it was on that training trip, you know, we'd gotten a couple of great missions in, you know, riding on helicopters, cruising around on the beach and, um, just doing some, some awesome, awesome training with, with awesome guys. It was just us out there. And, uh, and it was this event that we'd worked really hard to plan and, and make happen. And it was like towards the conclusion of that event, we were out having dinner and, and drinking beers and just kind of reminiscing on the year and, and everything else. And it was just, you know, kind of like how, how you often say, just Rangers telling stories and spending time together. And at some point kind of during that conversation, I, I did finally, you know, stop to reflect on, um, you know, my time in the regiment. Sure. Um, my time as a company commander, sure. But also just 10 years of service and, and where I'm at. And, um, you know, I was like talking to myself, like, Hey man, remember you know, all those goals we set, um, like this is it. You'd like, you, yeah. you, you've done those things you said you were going to do. Um, and it was extremely fulfilling and especially to be in the, the company of those guys, uh, in that place. And certainly something I look, look back on fondly. Yeah, it is. It is you're right. It, things go so fast. And then we added a, a fight on top yeah. of it, which makes it go even faster that we don't set back and reflect. I don't think as often as we should intentionally. And we do, I, you know, I found finally at one of those moments as like a first sergeant where I was in the office for the last day, like, wow, look, look what you've done. Look what yeah. we did. Look what, you know, look at yourself, which is hard to do, but, uh, army is a great place. It's a great place to be. The lessons learned, the friends you're going to make, the stories you're going to get is great. So for anybody out there thinking about joining the military, um, you won't, you won't regret the decision. I've met very few people that say sure. they regret staying in. I meet more people that say they regret because they, they transitioned, transitioned out too early, but let's move on to your, you know, life outside of uniform. Congratulations on almost maybe 10 years Thank married. You. Um, what's your key there to, to, <laughs> to marriage success? Uh, marry a ranger wife. That's <laughs> the secret. <laughs> uh, it's, I was actually, um, I was talking to, uh, to Mason Thornall 
this past week, and, and that's, <laughs> he, he jokingly said that all Rangers married up, but it's true. Because uh, few, uh, few people on this planet could, could kind of put up with the lifestyle. But um, so I guess, I mean, that is the secret. Marry someone you don't deserve. Right. And, and I think I did that in my wife, Brittany. And uh, I, I, we talked a little bit about how we balance the time. Um, I, I think kind of a, a key ingredient there is, is never stop dating your spouse. Um, I drive her insane on a daily basis. I wake up with, you know, uh, uh, telling funny jokes or jokes that I think are funny right. uh, to be top of mind, you know, so I never stop flirting, never stop joking around. Uh, I invest heavily in the relationship and make sure uh, we're able to spend quality time together. Um, and then we just talk, we talk often um, about, especially about the things that we know are going to be hard that are on the horizon. Um, major life moves coming up, you know, we're, we're moving here in a, a few months to, um, to Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. And, and we know that that's going to be a stressor. We know it's going to be hard. It's one of the hardest things that army family has to do. Yeah. And it gets harder when you start tacking kids on. Yeah. Um, and so when we see those kind of major transition points, there's like a theme arising here. Um, when we see those transition points coming up, we talk about it. Right. Um, we make sure we have a good plan to do it. And, uh, and we love each other through it and we give each other a lot of grace and patience. And, and when she's fired up about something, you know, I give her, give her the space and the time to, to, you know, work through it and support her through it. And when she knows I'm fired up about something, she does the same thing. Um, and, and, you know, I'm, that doesn't mean it's been perfect all the time. It doesn't mean it's perfect now. We've had plenty of bumps in the road as everyone has, uh, but her, her strength and, and her poise and resilience through, you know, five trips and, and everything else has just been, um beyond what most humans are supposed to be able to do. And I'm extremely, extremely fortunate that she puts up with me. Yeah, we all definitely married up. And uh, I'm, well, I'm very glad that they put up with us the way that they do. And uh, you're, I'm kind of the same way. I'm like a, um, a you know, a, a teenager around my wife. Oh, yeah. She, she's like, sometimes she's like, get away from me. <laughs> me quit touching me. Uh, but yeah, you got to be. And you brought up something there. I guess we'll go back a little bit. You're making a big change in your military. I mean, you're going to go from the infantry side to something new. Um, sure. Speak on that a little bit. Yeah. So, um, super hard decision um, is uh, I'm, I'm at that point in my career where I've I've commanded my last company. I've probably gone on my last you know mission. I've probably done my last FMP. Um, and uh, in my the next jobs in the infantry are um, you know being a, a battalion S three or an XO. Super hard. Super rewarding. Super good jobs. Um, but it's also at, at this kind of pivot point in our career, where I need to kind of make a decision, you know, whether or not I continue on that route and, and pursue higher levels of leadership and potentially command later on, or if I do something else. Um, you know, we talked a lot about the balance that we may or may not be able to achieve in our careers. And, and so I am, I'm making a, a deliberate decision to depart from the infantry, continue service. Um, cause that's something I, I will never be able to give up. I say never, <laughs> so we'll talk about it at 20. Yeah, right. Um, the, uh, but so to transition from service in the infantry over to a functional area called uh, simulation operations, it's a wide departure yes. from what I do presently, a wide departure. Um, but it's going to allow me to one, reinvest in my family, try to achieve that balance um, that I have not provided them over the last 10 years. Um, it'll slow down a little bit, hopefully. It'll still require plenty of me, no doubt. Um, but, uh, but it allowed me to reinvest my family and, and my children in, in a way that I believe that they deserve. Um, it's also a transition from being on the operational side and, and going to deploy and fight and do all that stuff um, to being on a support side, which is something I've never done before. And, and it's in a field that I don't fully understand. However, what I do know is, is I, I'm lucky to have um, comparatively seen a lot of the Army yeah. at 10 years and, and have you know gone and, and done things that I think make me reasonably well-rounded and, and position me in a way that I can add value to a department of the army that is, you know, pursuing hard problems and these strategic level uh, problems against adversaries that we don't have all the solutions for yet. And, and it's a field that I can get passionate about. And I can apply, you know, a lot of this, you know, uh, experience and just, um, you know, academic rigor that I, that I will enjoy uh, to these hard problems and, and try to solve it. So there's a lot of unknowns. I, I don't know fully what to expect. I'm excited about it. Um, and, uh, you know, maybe there's a, a chance for a, a ranger simulation officer somewhere down the road to, to come back and take another swing with, at a tambourine, but to be determined. Oh, that's good. Um, and I think you highlight something there. A lot of people misconception. You can make a drastic change oh, when yeah. you join the military. You're not tied to being an infantry officer. You're not tied to being an infantry NCO on those reenlistment points or those big moments of change. You can change your complete career sure. path and, and do something else. So. 
don't think that you're tied into one thing if you if you join service. But so if you were joining now uh, and you could go back and talk to Lieutenant Lane, um, <laughs> what 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 advice would you would you give him? Oh man. Um, so we talked a little bit about like information I'd give to new army officers. I definitely tell them that I'd say, Hey man, like buckle up. It's about to, it's about to get real. Um, I hope that I entered my early positions with humility and a degree of humbleness. Um, but, but I would also say, don't be afraid to affect change as a young leader who is well-informed and who is mentored by soldiers of experience. Yeah. Especially on the officer side, it feels as though we enter positions and achieve expertise in that position just in time to leave it. Yeah, for sure. So uh, those early jobs, especially, you know, platoon leader in the conventional force or as a ranger platoon leader, you're only going to be there for a year or 18 months. Um, and and you've, you're tasked with leading that platoon during that time and preparing them for combat and leading them in combat. Um, and it will take some time naturally to get your feet under you and, uh, you know, to, to figure out which way you're moving. But when you have a degree of confidence in the job and you have the mentorship of someone with experience to, to check your ideas against, don't be afraid to implement change or to drive that organization or to lead that organization. It's what those soldiers, it's what those rangers need from you. Yeah. It's why you're being paid. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, I was lucky. I, I was a, a platoon leader on three occasions, um, twice in the conventional force and then as a ranger platoon leader as well. And, and I was lucky to get those reps because th those mistakes I know I made as a very junior platoon leader, I was able to build on in the subsequent two platoons. Yeah. What the Reg and Regiment also does extremely well is, is we hire people who've done the job before, yeah. right? So our, our ranger commanders have been commanders already. And, yeah. and so we, um, we're, we're fortunate to, to have that confidence, that experience under our belt coming into the job to, to hopefully um, to, to lead appropriately. Uh, but don't don't hesitate to lead, I guess, would be the, the advice. Yeah, go, go all in, right? Go Absolutely. Go all in. Don't, don't, don't hold anything back. Go and enjoy whether it's uh, a two-year stint in service or a 20-year stint. Uh, get everything you can out of it. It's, it's, a, it's a great the army's great. It's yeah. it's a and you don't realize it until you're gone, like I am. Just how much <laughs> how much fun and how fast it really yeah. it really passes. So, we'll close it out here. We'll do the uh, the pod deck. I this is a new deck. I've never opened this deck. I have no idea what kind of questions are in here. Okay. And we'll do two each, and see where see what see what we get here. Um, you never know. Let me do it up here, A style. And uh, I'll let you start. Here, sure. take your. Take your cards, and uh, we'll, we'll see what we get out of it. <laughs> All right. What do you consider to be the most important piece of furniture in the house? Oh, <laughs> oh man. most It's probably my chair, right? <laughs> that, now that I'm like the old You have the old classic man, old man the chair? The old man rocking chair. <laughs> uh, I had actually had one for 15 years that I was just upgraded to. Like, I just retired from the Army. It's a leather recliner, you know, so... That's my go-to when I'm um, watching the basketball games through my eyelids at, at 8.30 when I'm falling asleep after my four kids <laughs> awesome. ha have worn me out. So that's probably the most key at, at this point. Uh, all right, we'll go to you. Oh, this is a deep one here. Uh, what do you think is not fair in today's society? Oh, it's not fair? <laughs> oh, man. See, I'm a very, like, I'm... I'm a bit, I'm a big like if it's not fair it doesn't matter just keep going kind of guy. Um I don't know. Um I don't think it's fair that oh man. I guess there's like there's illnesses and stuff that aren't fair. Yeah. That's that's certainly not fair. It's yeah. not fair that uh that, that people can um you know experience uh unproportional levels of hardship that they are not entitled to that's, and did nothing to deserve. I think that's perfect. Like you, you see the, the kid with cancer or yeah, something or terrible. even the kids in Afghanistan or the kids yeah. in, in Ukraine right now and all that craziness. I always just feel bad for the kids because they have no say in any, yeah. anything that's happening. It's not fair. All right. Back to you. All right. <laughs> what is the one thing you wish you had the money to pay someone to do for you? <laughs> Okay, at this point in my life, I wish I had the money to pay somebody to edit all of these podcasts <laughs> and videos that I do because um, I'm the career infantry guy and I I'm now spend a part of my day learning the Adobe Creative Cloud go. all day long and taking taking classes. So I wish I could pay somebody to take up that task for me <laughs> to give me back a little bit of it there. But yeah, right now, that's what I would do. I get that. 
If you could try out a job for a day just to see if you like it, what would it be? Ranger squad leader. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Ranger squad leader all day. Yeah. Well, how come? Why oh, the um, because uh, like that's. I mean, we go back to like my my early days. Um, you know, hunting fish and being outside. Like that, I I loved it. Um. And that's one of the things, like we talked about the pros and cons of being an officer. That's one of the cons. You'll be close to the fight, but it, it, the fight, you're, you're not designed to be uh, maneuvering fire teams or, or kicking doors. You're just yeah. not. Your function is different. Um, you understand how to do those things. You, you teach, frankly, which is bizarre, how to do those things. Um, but in practice, when, when, uh, where the rubber meets the road, um, it's, a, it's a ranger squad leader, ranger team leader making it happen. So if I had one job I could do for a day, ranger squad leader. And it, coming from somebody who's done that job, it's a great job. And I understand your perspective when there's something that you're part of, but yeah. can never do that one thing within it. Yeah. It's like, man, I wish I could just for a day be that person. Yeah. Just to see. It's just a different role. Like, even when you look outside when I'm at my house on a Saturday and I see my dog laying in the sun in the yard, that's, I'm just like, I wish I could do what you do. It's a good deal right there. Day, right. So just thanks for coming on. I really appreciate it. Um, uh, a lot of great lessons to be learned here. Don't be scared if you're thinking about joining the military. One thing you can do is reach out to people like Justin and myself and find somebody who's served or, you know, there's a number of ways to go pick those people's brains and, and gain as much perspective as you can before making it is a it is a big decision to oh, yeah. join to join service. But it's a it's a worthwhile decision. And our, like you said, our country needs great leaders to, to lead the next generation to the next fight, which is. You know, it could be tomorrow, right? You, you never know where it's going to be. But thanks for coming on. For all you listen and do all that stuff, like, share, subscribe, and we'll uh, catch up with you next week. Bye.